you have your Bibles, if, uh, if you'd like to, uh, to uh, follow some of it, keep in them, them open there at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And as Nelson has said, we will look particularly at the last four verses, verses 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Well, Nelson had just said mass wasn't his good point. Must not be mine either. That's five verses, not four. <laughs> Well, any one of you who have, who have spent any time reading the book of Hebrews would probably have noticed how systematic it is set out. And the stylistic form of our author here would appear to be that then of a sermon. A sermon which was probably in this book that, was, uh, that would have been written probably around the mid-60s and certainly before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., it was most likely addressed then to Jewish believers. You can see the whole format and the way it's written. Probably addressed to Jewish believers who, are, who were relocated to Rome by the Roman Emperor Pompey. A little bit of history, if you know the background. Um, Pompey led the conquest into Palestine in the, in the mid-60s BC. And, uh, and uh, this is when, in 64 BC, when the second temple was destroyed by him, he took a whole lot of Jews, a large number of Jews in 60 BC and resettled them around Rome. So there was a large Jewish congregation that was settled in this area at Rome. And also, of course, there would have been the proselytes, the Jewish proselytes, the Gentiles that, have, that had now confessed uh, Judaism and then had become Christians after this. So these Gentiles then that are residing here at Rome in and around the the, the the, uh, the place there, they would appear to have been subjected to all sorts of false teachings, all sorts of false teachings brought to them by false prophets. In particular, um, I just want to note three of them. And the one of these false teachings was a superiority, um, sorry, he would address this, he would address the superiority of Christ to the angels and also the superiority of the new covenant to the old. And to me, the letter of uh, the Paul writes to the, Colos uh, to, the Corinth to the Colossians make this very clear in chapter 2, verse 15, where he expresses this, the superiority of Christ over all things, when he says in 116, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Nothing then came into existence apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is superior to all. The second of those, uh, of those false teachings that seems to have been going around was regarding God's final revelation that has come in and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, and we need to remember this, that God's revelation of himself and of his purposes didn't come in one big package. It was suddenly just dumped down and said, there it is. Now, just study it and you will have it all. It's what we call a progressive revelation. God revealed himself and his purposes to us over a period of time. And we got more and more of, of, of his revelation that, that, uh, that uh, came to us. So here, the author to the, to the Hebrews says to the people, beware, he says, beware. Do not reject this final revelation which has come to us uh, through his son, the word that brought to us by his son. For he, he says before, how will we escape if we, know, if we neglect so great a, a salvation? And then thirdly, it's, uh, he, Jesus was considered by these false preachers to be less than the angels, to be lower than the angels. And he addresses this one as well. And uh, he says that for a while that Jesus, his son, yes, he was made lower than the angels. That is through the incarnation. However, this does not in any way suggest uh, inferiority to the angels. We read in Hebrews 2, 9, as uh, Nelson read earlier, and, and uh, 2, 17. But we do not see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And 17, therefore he had, in other words, he was obligated to be. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So having then brought 
these and addressed these uh, these uh, false teachings of these uh, of these false teachers. He now he now comes and he tells them the reasons why Jesus must have become man. And, and he gives us a number of, uh, of uh, reasons there in verses 14 through to 18. And those are the ones we will be looking at. So then in 14 to 15, he says, He became man that he might render the evil one powerless and deliver us from the fear of death. And then he says in 17 and 18, that He became man that he might become our high priest. And then in verse 17, he tells us he becomes man that he might make propitiation for our sins. Well, first of all, in verse 14, that he might render the devil powerless and deliver us from the fear of death. If Jesus was to destroy the works of the devil and propitiate the wrath of God against sinners he had he tells us in verse 70 he had he was obligated to be he had to become one of us it was absolutely necessary for him to fully identify with us there was no other way in the words there of of, um, of uh, verse 14 he had to become like us in every single respect there was my bible uses that word likewise and uh, the, the one nelson read from used the same word likewise is used here to suggest that he becomes like us in every respect. This means he had to be born of a woman as you and I were born of women. He had to enter this, this life in the same way as you and I did. And he had to leave this life by death in the same way that you and I did. And Galatians makes, of course, his birth very, very clear. From Galatians 4.4 4, he says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law he was under obligation to keep the law of god as much as you and i were under obligation to keep it so then jesus comes he takes our nature so that he is a man among men that he might bear the punishment for our sins destroying the works of the devil the evil one in his first epistle john actually expresses what we've already read here in Hebrews. John 1, 3, 8. He says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now you can imagine for the Jews, this was absolute anathema. Their Messiah die? Impossible. This could never, never be. He was the one who was to come. He was the one who was to deliver them from their enemies. He was the one who was to establish his rule and his kingdom from Jerusalem. He was the one that would, that would come and they would rule over all the empires, all the nations of the world, over all their enemies. And so how could, they, how could their Messiah then die? And as they gather around the cross, as the Savior hangs upon that cross, crucified upon that cross, they mock him saying, come down. Come down from the cross. Come and save yourself. In other words, they are saying, come down from that cross. That will prove that you are the Messiah. The Messiah will not die at the hands of his enemies. He will come and rule over them all. Come down from that cross. Then we will believe. So as he hangs there dying on the cross, it appears also to all intents and purposes that the, power of, the powers of evil had prevailed. Had not God forsaken him? My God, my God, he cries, why have you forsaken me? He cries there of what we call dereliction or of anguish. Our sins must be, our sins are laid upon him. And as he becomes sin for us, the father turns his face away. And the Lord Jesus cries out in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, at the cross, then, we see this decisive encounter with the powers of evil. The outcome here is certain. This is why Jesus came, to nullify the works of Satan who wields the power of death. A Lord comes to undo them, these works of Satan. But let us never, ever forget, as, as, as sometimes seems to be done, let us never forget that Satan held the power of death only in a secondary sense. Satan is a finite, created creature. We seem to forget this sometimes. 
He's a finite created creature and as such he is subject to the judgment of God. There is no cosmic dualism as we sometimes find is past. There's no cosmic dualism between God and Satan as if the two were, they were equals. Satan is a created being. In the Garden of Eden, the sentence of death pronounced by God, it was pronounced by God, not, not to Satan, is in judgment of man's sin. When Adam decided to, to listen to the serpent and so disobey God, death was therefore God's judgment on man's sin, and it was not Satan's victory, as sometimes we find that, uh, that uh, people seem to espouse. So by listening to Satan, so by listening, pardon, by listening to Satan, man rejects fellowship with God, choosing to follow the lies of Satan, who through sin now holds the power of death over man. But this is the very thing that will lead to his ultimate destruction. We read in a lovely passage in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Christ's victory at, Cal at Calvary was decisive. Satan is a defeated foe. His time is short. Now is the time when the Lord will gather all his elect from all the nations, and he will bring them in from all the nations of the world. And when his task of bringing all his people in is complete, when the gospel has been preached to all the nations, and all the sheep of his fold have been brought in, then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Until then, we are told, he goes around as a roaring lion seeking to frustrate the purposes of God by causing us to dishonor the name of the Savior. In the words of Ephesians 6.16, he shoots these flaming darts at us, tempting us to sin, tempting us to reject the, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the meantime, we have our shield of faith to defend ourselves, to defend ourselves from those fiery darts which he shoots at us, resisting every temptation and remaining true to our Savior. Oh, praise God. Things are not as they appear to be. By dying, forsaken of God, he dies the death that we should die. And by dying, he conquers death, rising again on the third day. He renders the powers of evil powerless. In the words of Colossians, he triumphs over them. Now here Paul uses the image of the conquering Roman general. He returns triumphant to Rome, riding on his steed with all his with all his, his, his wonderful garments upon him, he rides ahead of the procession. Behind him comes the conquered people, probably the king and the other nobles, often naked, chained together. Behind them would come the wagons of all the booty, and the Roman general rides ahead, triumphant over his enemies. This is the picture we're given here in Colossians of the Lord Jesus Christ as he triumphs over these powers of evil. When... He tells us in Colossians 2.15, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. It is he, the Lord Jesus Christ, who holds the keys, who holds the keys of death firmly in his own hand, and no one is able to wrench them out of his hand. All power and authority has been given to him. Nothing, no one is able to overpower him. Amen. This could only be accomplished then by him becoming a man. John, sitting in the island of Patmos, he is visited by the Lord Jesus Christ in all his resurrection glory. And in Revelation 1.18, he says to John, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Life then is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. All other ways lead to death. So our author here then having told us that Christ has conquered death, our author goes on to tell us that in doing so he delivers us from the fear of death. George Guthrie in his, uh, in his commentary on, um, on Hebrews um, um, quotes a well-known saying of Woody Allen, who most of you would have heard of. 
And Woody Allen said this. He said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Well, funny as that may sound, the fear of death is not the sole preserve of Woody Allen. I think that, uh, I think that to some degree we all have that fear of death within us, either to a greater or to a lesser extent. Well, having conquered death, we are told that the Lord delivers us from the fear of death to which we are then in bondage. The death we fear is, yes, it is that physical death, but it's also what happens, what comes after death that we fear. There are those few who actually, uh, sorry, there are very few who actually hold that physical death is the end. Surveys that have been done sort of indicate that everyone has this deep down hope, this deep down longing that there is something after, after death, that there is some life after death, that longing seems to exist there. A believer, as a believer, should no longer be enslaved by the fear of death, for death has been conquered. At the cross, Christ conquered death. So why, why, why then do we fear death? Well, there are many reasons why we may fear death, and uh, these are probably fairly individual. So here I only want to mention three, which I think might apply to, uh, to, uh, to most of us uh, to some degree. And the first one I noted on here was I think that, th that there's this great fear of leaving, of leaving loved ones behind. How will they cope when we are no longer there? What is going to happen to them in the future? Will, who will do the things that I've normally done? Who's going to do that for them? Will they be financially secure? And what if they fall or break a hip when you're not at home or fall off a motorbike out in the bush somewhere and there's no one there to help them? And these are real fears. And then for, for some, there is that feeling that we have a task to do. The Lord might have given us a task to do. And we have only just started that, just, just beginning to go. And we feel now this whole ministry that we've started or the task that we are doing is just starting to come to fruition. And we want to finish it. We want to be there. It, we haven't done this thing that we're given to do. We haven't finished it. And so there is that that, that fear, if I can call it that, of not wanting to go yet. But I think our greatest fear that we have is because we don't know what it's going to be like. Kerry Packer once said, there's nothing after death. I've been there. And uh, he, had, he had a heart attack. He was resuscitated. And, he can, and after he said, there's nothing there. I've been there. Well, we're not talking about resuscitation. We're talking about real death here. And I think and it's something that is out of the world of our comprehension. It's something we just do not understand. We've never experienced anything like it, nor have we ever spoken to anyone, spoken to anyone who has truly died and come back to life. So we haven't a clue what to expect. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate going to a dentist. And to a dentist, I must go. And, uh, and we're under COVID at the moment. Unfortunately, my dentist appointment has been cancelled twice, which I can't say I'm not sorry about, but it's still to come. And I don't like going to the dentist. I hate going to the dentist. And you know why? Because I know exactly what it's like. It's, uh, it's not that I have any fear. I just know what it's like, and I know I don't want it. I know that I'm going to go there, and Owen's going to be prodding and poking and drilling and then he's, he'll never stop talking. He starts talking the moment I get there, and then he asks me questions and things, and he's got his hands in my mouth, and I can't answer. Goes, rawr, rawr. Yeah? And I don't like it. So that is something. But dying, that's a totally different matter. I don't know what it's like. I have no idea. So there's a certain element of, of, of fear, if I can use that word, in this idea of dying. Or perhaps, as believers... As believers, we do have some sort of an inkling. But as believers, it's a little bit different. We know of one who has gone before us. And we've read on this, and we've read here on verse 10 above, where it says, It was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvations through sufferings. Christ is described here as the author. He's described as the pioneer or captain of our salvation, depending on what version that you are using. 
Well, the actual word in the, in the original there is the word, and excuse the pronunciation, it's probably all wrong, but it's the word archigos. Now, you know what that word arch means? That word arch means you have an archdeacon, he's the head of all the deacons. You have an archbishop, he's the head of, the bish of all the bishops, and, uh, and so on. And uh, so we know that this word arch means the first or the, or the head, honcho, the numero uno, the chief, the leader. And uh, as applied then here to the Lord Jesus Christ, this idea that he is the leader, he is the pioneer, he's the first one, he is the leader. He's the one who has gone ahead and shows the way, and then he will bring the rest of us to that intended goal. He is the first fruits, it's, he described, the first fruits from the dead. He has been there, he has pioneered the way. And now he comes there and he will take us through to our intended goal, to the place where he has prepared for us. We used to go up, once upon a time, up to the Grampians, and Jude and I used to, uh, used to, used to look after a, a, um, a, the young people. And at the Grampians of those who might have been there, uh, Lake Belfield is on the one side, and uh, just at the dam wall, when you look up the other side, it's a very steep hill. It goes, I think, in places much more than 45 degrees up. Well, there's one particular morning these young people have decided they're going to go up and climb up the top of this by the wall, walk along the ridge into Hall's Gap down the bottom. And we had to come. No, 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 we couldn't be left behind. We had to come. Fine. We meet them in the morning. It's not a hard walk, we're told. Easy. We meet them in the morning. The first thing I see is David. Here he's got a big rope wrapped around him. He's taking this rope. And I said, David, what you got that rope for? He said, oh, just in case. So I said, I thought this was an easy walk. We're not going to need it. No, no, I'm only taking it in case. Fine. We start going up. We start climbing up. We get a little way up. Uh-oh, we can't get any further this way. We better turn and go right. So we head off right to see if we can get round up to the top. We can't get past. It's blocked. Hey, you at the back there. Head backwards, go back, go back. So they all start going back and everyone moves back and eventually we try another way to get up. That didn't work either. At this point, Jude and I thought, uh-uh. So we said, we're going to leave you to it. You go, we're going back. Well, to cut a long story short, they made it to the top eventually and through to Hall's Gap. But why do I tell you this? Why do I tell you this little story? Because there's one thing that is certain, that unless the Lord returns... Each and every one of us is going to experience death. But the point is, our Archigos, our leader, he has gone ahead. He has tasted death for everyone, Hebrews 2.5. By suffering death, he knows the way. He's been there. He's pioneered the way. He takes us by the hand, and he will lead us unerringly through. He has pioneered the way. There is no obstacles to be overcome or encountered. Christ has been there, and he leads us unerringly an, 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 an to our goal that we might receive our crown of life and promises never to leave or forsake us. There is nothing then, there is nothing in life or in death that can separate us from him. This is abundantly clear from Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, but nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is to be found in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word that is used there when he says, I am convinced, has the sense of certainty. It has, there's no shadow of, of a doubt. We're secure in his love, so we have absolutely nothing to fear. And there is nothing at all that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But we need to note this very carefully, that it is not our fickle love for him, but his love for us. And this love exists only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ as we are united to him in faith. It is the same almighty, same powerful love that raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. A love that will never, ever let us go. A love that will not be parted from us for a second. A love so powerful that nothing can break 
that bond between us and our Savior. We have nothing to fear then in death. Death is swallowed up in victory. All fear is gone. Corinthians 15.55 expresses this well. O oh, death, where is your victory? Answer, there's no victory in death. O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is gone. With it all its fear. Death would have no power over us then if it was not for sin. And where there is no sin, there is no death. For the one whose sin is forgiven, there is no death. And where there is no death, there is nothing to be feared. All fear is gone. Now, if you've, have you ever thought why there is no, why there's eternal life, there's no death in heaven? There shall be no sin. And it is sin that brought death in. God's judgment upon sin. Well, a writer then goes on and he tells us that the, that the next reason why Jesus becomes man is so that he might become our high priest. So his work then on earth completed and we are told that he becomes our high priest. And the same Jesus then who was crucified, he conquered death, rendered the devil powerless, delivering us from the power of death, having passed through the heavens Hebrews 4.14 tells us, is now seated at the right hand of majesty on high, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, representing us before the throne of God. Now, those who have read Hebrews will know that the major part of Hebrews is actually addressed to the topic of the high priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, here we can only just, just touch the surface of it is. But we have noted yeah, then that Satan is a defeated foe and he knows it but in the meantime he will cause as much disruption as he can for the work of the gospel our times then that we live in have been referred to as the gospel age the Lord Jesus Christ as I said before is building his church calling his elect in while Satan goes around like a roaring lion trying to disrupt that work he binds, he tells us in 2 Corinthians uh, 4 and 4, he binds the minds of the unbelieving so th that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He shoots, as we said, flaming missiles at us. And so he tempts us to sin, that, we might, that he might accuse us before the throne of God. And here we are told that, that Jesus also suffered temptation. He was tempted as we are. He, was, he had the same temptations as we are. Yet Hebrews 4.15 tells us he was tempted yet as we are, yet without sin. This is something we could not do. And where there is no temptation, where they, we, sorry, there can be no temptation without the possibility of sinning. His temptation, of course, was severe oh, in those 40 days in the desert after his baptism when Satan met him there and tried to distract him from the course that was set before him. Then Luke tells us that throughout his ministry, Satan never left him. He left him for a while, he says, meaning that Satan was always there, tempting him, tempting him to veer off the path that was set before him. And then, of course, his final temptation would have come there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The pain and the agony of the cross that, that loomed there before him. He was to be crucified. He was to be, he was to be, uh, to, to, be to, to, to be beaten with rods. He was to be scourged, abandoned by his father. Was there no other way he could accomplish his mission? A father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. He did not want to suffer all that had to be suffered. And yet his plea was, yet not my will, your will. But if there was another way, Father, could we do it the other way? What anguish of spirit he suffered. Yet he remained steadfast, without sin, determined to do his father's will. By becoming man, by becoming one with us, Suffering for us, suffering with us, one of us, he is qualified to be our high priest. Representing us before God, 
He knows what it is like to suffer, we are told in chapter 4. So he can suffer, so he can sympathize with, with our struggles and our weaknesses. Now we can approach the throne of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The barrier of sin between God and us has been broken down. The veil has been torn in two. The penalty for sins, past, present, and future, has been paid. Our sins have been forgiven. Now, as God's new covenant people, we may enter into the very presence of God behind the veil through a high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever we wish. Not only once a year in the Day of Atonement, for he has fulfilled that day. All the intentions, all the purposes of the Day of Atonement have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ as he offered himself for us. Only the high priest then could enter into the Holy of Holies to make propitiation for sin. The book of Hebrews will tell us that our author, uh, it will tell us that a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, enters the holy place with his own blood, not the blood of bull or goats, Hebrews 9.12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus then, our high priest, enters the very presence of God. How is this possible? Because he offered himself as a propitiatory offering to God. As Hebrews puts it, he enters with his own blood and presents this before God. At Calvary then, at Calvary, the wrath of God falls on Jesus, the Lamb of God, as he makes him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I always think that's such a wonderful picture. He takes our sin so that God the Father turns his face away and he gives us this magnificent white robe that covers all our sin, this robe of righteousness. He takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. Christ's death then was sufficient to appease or to turn away God's righteous hatred of sin and satisfy his holy demands for justice. The demands of the law with its demands for holiness have been met by Jesus' obedience to the Father. Leviticus 11.45 For I am the Lord God who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus, the demands of the law, thus you shall be holy as I am holy. He took our sin, clothed us in his, in his righteousness. A wonder of wonders that he should do a thing like that, that he should so love us, poor wretched sinners. Just above, in Hebrews chapter 2, there in verse 3, our author had started off by saying, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Today, he says, if you hear his voice, his call to examine yourself in the light of his word, to see if you are holy as he is holy. We need to come to him confessing our sin. We need to fall before him confessing that we are sinners, that we are unworthy of him and pleading for his forgiveness. Anyone who comes to him in this way, he has promised he will not cast out, but will joyfully receive as one of his own. Each one of us needs to examine ourselves lest we, like all those who came out of Egypt, fall by the way because of unbelief. Please make sure that you are not one of those. Examine yourself. See if you be in the faith. If any sin be found in you, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one and the only place where you can find forgiveness for your sin, and he will not cast you out. Amen. Well, let's give thanks to the Lord for our service this morning. Loving Father, we thank you and we praise you for our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks that he was indeed a faithful high priest. And Father, we thank you that he indeed did 
absorb and exhaust all of your wrath against us, against his own people. And Father, we give thanks that the power of the devil has been broken, that he has been defeated. And Father, we give thanks for the great hope that we have that Christ is indeed returning. And Father, we ask you for your blessing on our time together. We pray, Lord, that we would take away and apply the things that we have heard this morning, that we would live in awe and amazement and wonder at Christ. We would cry out to Christ for salvation, for those perhaps listening, Lord, who do not know who Jesus is, who do not know what it is to have forgiveness, to have new life. Father, we ask you for your blessing, and we give thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.